Valentina Petrillo, next stop, Paris. The Italian Paralympic sprinter is on her way to the big show, and she will become the first out transgender athlete to compete in a Paralympic Games. The Italian sprinter is an 11, was an 11-time Italian champ before transition and after transition. She just kept the beat rolling, 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 and we already know there's going to be a world of hurt coming down. Maybe she'll end up like this person, Amani Khalif of Algeria, winning her Olympic gold medal in boxing. And now she's announced that all those people that rode down on her and called her a man, she's suing them. She's filed suit in France against the Daily Mail, the Telegraph, J.K. Rowling, um, Elon Musk. Uh, I hope you guys have some very, very deep pockets because she's coming for you. And she's got a pretty airtight case. Then, also, later on, we're going to talk about Erica Smith tonight. Annoyingly positive. Remember, we did the special on her last month. Well, her and a group of plums of Sweet Park College, Virginia, are going are mounting action against the college because the college has decided to ban transgender women from attending. And oh, also tonight, our, your favorite British endurance racer and my Charlie Martin was on BBC Four's The Red Line this afternoon with Sharon Davies. Yeah. With me is Charlie Martin, a British racing car driver and transgender rights activist, making the case for that open category in sport is Sharon Davis. Trans athletes are, are not a threat in sport. This is a myth. And in fact, there's some quite compelling science and factual information that demonstrates this. Trans people have been in sport for 100 years. Trans men were competing back in the 1920s. This is not a new phenomenon. The International Olympic Committee has allowed people, trans people to compete since 2004. In that time, not a single trans person has won a medal or broken a record or dominated. Trans people make up 1% of the population. It's pretty widely acknowledged. That 1%, only a small fraction play sports, let alone at a elite level or a professional level. And so the idea that trans people will dominate sport against the other 99% of people in the world is highly improbable. And we have this kind of mass panic and it all seems to stem from an abstract fear of a perceived threat that has never really manifested itself. Hello again, everybody. I'm Carly Chardonnay Webb, your commentator with the Cat Ears. This is Transposition Sports. All that in the roundup and more coming up throughout this. But first, some appreciation for an Olympic hero. Bree, kick it. Nikki Hilt, American middle distance runner, hometown Abdos, California. At the Olympic trials in July, they ran their way right into our heart by winning a national championship and setting a record and punching their ticket to the Olympic Games in Paris. In Paris, they didn't disappoint. Rip through the round, and I mean rip through them, and even showed us that they got moves. Jack Hilt, an Olympic gold medal winner in the long jump, Tara Davis Woodhall out. And by the way, Tara, good luck to your husband at the Paralympics coming up in a couple weeks. Now, Hilt, didn't win an Olympic medal. Did reach the 1500 meter final, then is seventh. But nonetheless, they are a hero to many of us. Nikki Hilt, you done good. You done real good. And look who's joining me tonight. I am not alone. This is what happens if Sports Center and the McLaughlin Group had a child. I've got Stephanie Hill. <laughs> I've got Ben Hamilton here on yeah. Transposition Sports. And I want to talk <sighs> for a minute, first off, about Nikki Hiltz. Weren't they marvelous? Absolutely. They were. I mean, weren't they marvelous? Um, and one thing about Nikki, they aren't done. They're still young. They can make another run in L.A. in four years. But in the short term, I could see the world championships in the next year. Um I can tell you, but one thing, though, uh, they were throwing against, Hiltz was throwing against a stack deck, uh, especially in that final, as fast as that final would be. And first off, I mean, it took speed and it took faith. 
Kip Yagon that is to win that 1500. Uh, that that's the thing. It was, I mean, Kip Yagon, Jessica Hole from Australia. Um, it was a, it was a blistering pace that was put up and there was a point in the bell lap where it looked like Hiltz could have a shot, but then Hiltz got jostled by Jerry for Kenya from Kenya. And it just took the wind out their sails, but nonetheless, Nikki Hiltz did a great job. I'm just wondering, take it around the horn real quick for the both of you. What are your, what, one memory that you have from these games, if you watched so many, so many memories from the games and, I, and I'm still watching replays because there are too many sports that I enjoy watching. And just the fact that so many of these people you see on the screen and you can judge them all you want of like, oh, this person wasn't the gold medal winner. Or they, they weren't as fast as this other person. Like, I dare anybody to get out on the track with these people or get into the pool with Katie Ledecky, get um, onto the climbing wall with any of these people. Like, they're among their their peers, but any one of us, more than likely, and uh, except with the exception of some of the professional athletes here, like, the majority of us could not ever hope to to last with these people in that sport like they they may look slow compared to some of their other peers but like don't be fooled like these are some incredible feats of human strength human agility uh human speed all of these incredible attributes and and smarts and, 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 smart. and, and that's the other thing too like and, and i'm sure we'll get into this as we go on but too often people think of athleticism being a male trait or being primarily muscle strength, like weightlifting strength. And that's all they think athletics is. But people forget that if you don't have strategy, if you don't have agility, if you don't have like determination, perseverance, all of these things together make an athlete. And, and I think more often than not, people who aren't athletes are the ones judging most of the time because they don't, they don't see those other pieces. But if you're the one training day in and day out, like, you know that you could have a bad day and it's not your day. Like if your timing is off on those punches, you're, you're not going to win that day. And people don't get it. Even if you're the biggest, strongest person in the room, it might not be your day. And chromosomes don't mean shit. Like we're going to, we're going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and and one, 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 one person real quick. I want to bring up. Since you talked this, about this brain and day. athleticism, yeah. If you talked about brains and athleticism, I want to talk about Gabby Thomas, who who won the two who won the two hundred meters. Gabby Thomas, United States graduate, undergraduate from Harvard, graduate's degree from the University of Texas, right now running running a free health clinic in Austin. And is an Olympic champion. Uh, I mean, right there. That's just. But there's a whole lot of what you're seeing. That, I mean, brains and brawn don't have to be mutually exclusive. That's one thing. Stephanie, what you about know, you? What was your Olympic memory? I well, I you know, I, I I'm I'm biased, obviously, and that you can see that this is my sport, and and tragedy can occur, and and it did occur for Stu McNay and and. Uh, his crew uh, in the 470s, which is the mixed dinghy. Uh, the the uh, 470s used to be men's 470s, women's 470s, but they decided to make it a mixed thing. Um, and uh, there are some uh, some women who are who are steering. There are some and some men who are steering. And it's really you know. It's, an, it's such an equipment dependent sport and a, and a type form thing. Uh, uh, have Steph say have it and they're doing the next. Okay. Uh, uh, it, 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 so it's, it, it's really it, quite fascinating. I know Stu and, and, and he, his, his uh, when it was a men's thing, my, my uh, uh, this kid who's like, uh, 20 years younger than me or so, 20, well, 25 years younger than me, sailed with me when he was in high school on my J24. So, yeah, my Olympic memory was still, <laughs> was that team going to the wrong side of the race course and winding up almost second, almost second to DFL, which was not a good move. 
Ben, Ben, and Ben and I watched the watched that little contest, and I was provide, providing commentary all the way through. It's like, oh no! <laughs> but you know, it's it's I I didn't have an opportunity to watch a good deal of a, a whole bunch of the Olympics, but there's it has been a memorable games, really really memorable games, and the thing that always strikes me is for the athletes it is such a tremendous honor to be representing your country and it is it, it it's almost it, it, it's it's it, it makes me heart sick to think that people would stoop so low to take away that moment in a 25 year old woman's life and it's not just it's it's it, there were two women both won gold and they were both maligned you're talking about also by, um taiwan's lin yuting winning lin yuting in her division winning, in boxing as yeah. well and in, in, one in thing i will give class. yeah well one thing i i'll give the the people of her hometown in taiwan they swung up taiwan swung up for her i mean yeah. I've never seen it. I saw an entire country just say, J.K. Rowling, you're not welcome here. And that was just something to see the the support that I saw that I saw from from and both the that, Algerian fans. Because after all, Alger, Algeria was a colony of France. So you have a lot of Algerians who live in France and they were there. Oh, Algerian flags all over the place, though, the fight against Suwon Fang from Thailand, the championship, that felt like a, a title fight in Las Vegas. That's what that felt. It had the electricity of a world champ, of a of a professional championship fight. That's and that is what, that gives me a good deal of hope because I, from, the, from so many perspectives, we talked about this last week, about, uh, you know, how this has to have made an impact with with uh, the IOC, uh, and and how they're going to approach this well, stuff, because their it's... statement their statement on this on this issue was really quite forthright and in keeping with the with the uh, 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 with the framework that they propounded in twenty twenty one November twenty twenty one, and it's it's got to have made a it's got to have made an impact on. Not just the IOC, but uh, uh, world aquatics, world athletics, and world sailing. It, 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 you know, what you open yourself up, but what we were saying all along, what you open yourself up for when you basically have opened the door to people saying, she's not a woman. Because she doesn't dress like one. She doesn't. She doesn't engage in the feminine attributes. You open yourself up to a, a position where you're going to start accusing. Uh, you're going to start accusing, and I say accusing, as if it's a bad thing. And, and, and right. that's the other. That's the other part of the story. It's like, why is being trans bad? Well, see, that's the thing. Um, I, for myself, love all the think pieces. Loved all the loved all the people who spoke out for Monica Khalif. But there's the question. And and before anyone says it, yes, we know what Algeria's laws are. To me, they're immaterial. They're immaterial in this case because that is often used as a deflection to talk about what we need to be talking about. And two weeks in the Paralympics. We will be talking about it. Kick it, Bree. Because of a certain a certain sprinter from Bologna, Italy, named Valentina Petrillo, who qualified. And Valentina's quit. Before transition, mind you, all those people say, hey, she was lousy in the men's event. No, before transition, 11-time Italian para-athletic champion in the sprints. He transitioned in 2019. 
finally got the right to run in 2020. Final and won an Italian championship. Repeated in 21, 22, and in 23, she had a breakthrough. Here she is at 400 meters at the World Para Athletic Championships last year in Paris. Digging around the corner, ended up third in the 400 and ended up third in the 200. Valentina Petrillo is a definite medal threat. Going into these Paralympic Games, he has the 10th fastest time in the world this year at 200 meters, the sixth fastest time at 400. And based on past season, she hasn't hit anywhere near her peak yet. And on Monday, September 2nd, she stands in the blocks for the first round of the 400. Now, her now she has a story. And part of that story is an inspiration. Go back. Sherman, set the wave back machine for 1980. Kick it, Bree. Keep it going. 1980, Moscow, Summer Olympics. Yes, I know. The Americans weren't there, but the Italians were. And there was a sprinter, iconic sprinter, legendary sprinter, former 200-meter world record holder, Pietro Manea. And Manea got to the finals of the 200 meters in Moscow. Now, what did this what did this Bambino do? Well, let me tell you. Settling in the blocks just ahead of Britain's Alan Wells. Alan Wells won the 100 meters earlier in the week. And Wells was looking to get that double. But and early on, it looked like he was going to get it. Wells made him make up the stagger from the start. Silvio Leonard from Cuba is also there. This is going to be a fight. It looks like Alan Wells is going to get double gold, but check out Manea. Check out Manea. Just like a Ferrari. He got in seventh gear and got through it, winning the 200 meters in an upset. One of the people watching, a six-year-old Valentina Petrillo. And Petrillo considers uh, Manea a hero to her. And now 44 years later, she's getting her opportunity. Now, first off, let's talk about the obvious thing. You know, and it's already starting. I mean, icons, J.K. Rowling, Sharon Davies, they're all, the, the anti-trans people are already chirping. They're already chirping. A note to all the people, all that smoke that you had for a money halif, all that, all that protective energy you have for her. Here's the here's the moment of truth. Will that be there for Valentina Petrillo? Yeah, I'm asking both of you. What what's it? I mean, what's the what's the temperature going to look like? Yeah, for her. Step in there, I don't know. I I don't I don't know, and it, it's very hard to tell because. A couple, a couple of things here, though, um, and it's unfortunate that it seems to be that a lot of the general public do not care about the Paralympics. Um, they'll watch the Olympics and and they'll call it like they'll think of it as you know the real Olympics, and they separate these out and. The, so I, I don't think it's going to have the same publicity as, you know, boxing in, in the Olympics with that situation. However, um, it really could be it could be anything. Um, I, I expect that if if it does get publicity, um, people will immediately go to the negative, And I'm sure that that's going to be the case. So I'm I'm not hopeful uh i i don't expect i don't expect much in her favor and like from from the publicity side i hope i'm wrong i really hope i'm wrong but just the way that the climate has been with regard to cis people like i i'm not i'm not hopeful that it's going to miraculously change based on the recent events Stephanie, what are you thinking? I don't think it will either, to be honest. I I, I think that uh, there's 
but I think that what happened uh, in the in in the um, in the Olympics just now is illustrative of of uh, how absurd it is to to uh, draw these border lines where they're being drawn, considering that we've had a a a, a, a twenty four year history of not drawing these border lines where they're being drawn. And we're just we're just now seeing, you know, if if you think that if you think that um, uh, uh, the world population of transgender individuals is, let's say, four tenths of a percent of the world population, that means there should have been like with with uh, uh, what thirteen thousand athletes in in Tokyo, you would have. You would have thought there would be would have been more than one transgender representative there, and it just isn't happening. And the reason it's not happening is because transgender people are have been have been too afraid to participate in in that area of life. I mean, it, it's it, growing up trans. It's you know when you're when you're talking about an athletic career, you're talking about. These are these are things you get involved with when you're a kid, and when you're and when you're bullied off the when you're bullied off the playground, when you're bullied off the race course, when you're bullied out of out of that aspect of things, you're not going to go into sport. You're just not, and 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 that's why trans people have been underrepresented in in history throughout history. And now that oh well, one person decides to, you know, suit up and dive into the pool, or hit the track, or hit the race course. It's, you know, it 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 it, it gives you sort of a creepy feeling that why are you really uh, why are you really going here? Uh, and I don't think that the, I don't think that you know uh, I don't think that a, a guy, for instance, like Pine Creek, who's been making he's been stumping all over the damn internet about oh this is terrible, and it's not just people like him who are right wingers. It's a whole bunch of people will say I'm a woman until I uh, until I'm doing that, and well, and I and think... I, I just think it's kind of I, I think it's kind of kooky, and people kind of need to need to reevaluate what sports are what they mean uh, uh people say well i don't care about sports but they do care about games don't they what was gamergate all about you know True. people do care about playing games and sports are fundamentally a game it's competition and uh whether it's whether it's uh, playing trivia on Dr. Ben's trivia night, or whether it's or whether it's uh, or or whether it's trying to trying to do something as absurd as 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 beating people at a, at the great speed of four and a half knots, it 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 it, it doesn't matter. It's a game. You're, it's a game you play, and uh, I do think that people care about that. And when you draw the line, when you draw the line, keep us out of that area. Where do you draw the line next? That's my question. Well, I can say that there was there was someone in the chat who was saying that Paralympics gets ignored, so Valentina might not get as much press. Well, well, first off, the Paralympics will have forty five hundred athletes from one hundred and fifty four nations. It will be the second mm -hmm. largest sporting event in the world this year, obviously behind the behind the Olympic Games that just ended. However, one thing about the Paralympics, number one, there is a big push to get more people to watch, especially in the United States. Para, Team USA Paralympians have been all over social media and the and those who just who just competed in the Olympics are also being part of that effort. NBC and Peacock are upping their NBC through Peacock through their networks are upping their commitment. They're going to show more hours than ever. Peacock will show every event. So I, it, it's accessible, but also 
in the rest of the world. For example, Channel 4 in the UK is the Olymp is the Paralympic broadcaster. They get ratings for the Paralympics that rival the Olympics. So, yeah. and in a lot of countries, I put a commitment. Um, on, I mean, SBS and Network 7 in Australia, they put up a hefty commitment to the Paralympics. So a lot All of right. nations are going to be watching. France 24 will provide as much coverage of the Paralympics as they did the Olympics. That was in their home country. So this will be covered. And the Valentina All story right. will be covered. I mean, she was on, she was front page of, of Gazzetta del, of, of La Gazzetta del Sport in Italy today. She was on the front page. So this is a story that I think it will have legs in the, and the big, and the big sport turfs like Linda Blade and, and Nancy Hogshead and Avertilofa are already jumping on this. So again, I, I'm imploring those people that I'm imploring those people, uh, if you've got that much smoke to be protective, you better be prepared to speak out. And there's also another thing that also has this. If Valentino Petrillo wins a gold medal because the prime minister of Italy made sure that she got to as many, she got to shake hands with as many medal winners as possible. We know who Giorgia Meloni is. Una donna, una madre, una italiana, una cristiana, un anti-gay, un anti-LGBT. <laughs> Well, we know who well, they, they hey, don't call Carly, Mussolini yeah, for nothing now. And Carly, she's Carly for Christ's sake, she's cis alpine. What do you want? You know. <laughs> but that's one thing we have to look at. And another person whose mouth was run who's already been running about this, you know, Karen. I mean Sharon Davies, our favorite, our favorite <laughs> transphobic swimmer from the UK. She's already run her mouth this, and today. She was on BBC Four, a show called The Red Line, where they bring people from opposing viewpoints together and see if we can find common ground, have a civil discussion. Well, Karen, I mean, Sharon was on the show with British Endurance Racing and transgender trailblazer Charlie Martin. And needless to say, and first, I'm a big fan of Charlie Martin. And you know that Charlie oh, yeah. is as wonderful off the track as she is fast on it. and. Sharon Davies tried to use that, tried to use that as a weakness. Don't believe me? Bree, kick it. If we really want to improve women's sport, then if we want to make it fair, then we need God. to remove the, the, the boundaries, the obstacles for fairness. And that's not trans people. And also this, you know, this transphobic narrative, it affects, it affects all trans people. In America, 25 out of 50 states have banned trans kids from playing sport in the gender that they identify as there's a lot there sharon i wonder yeah, if you want to reflect back uh, to absolutely. charlie absolutely very happy to unpack what you've it, yeah. heard so, her say to so charlie the youngsters that have been banned from sport in america the trans youngsters have not been banned from sport they've been banned from a category they don't qualify for i'm gonna so hold you i'm gonna i'm gonna be really tough here sharon in terms of what i really want you to do is reflect back i can't um, i can't answer this if it's misrepresented so i need to give you the facts and the science the toxic nature of this discussion and the, and the misunderstandings that it creates in society really severely impact the lives of trans people in this country. You know, hate crimes have increased by 186% in the last five years against trans people. And so I think when we're having this discussion, we do need to rely on science. We do need to be clear and level-headed and, uh, and, and not kind of dogmatic in our, mm. in our viewpoints. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, when we talk about hate crimes in the UK, a woman gets killed every two days in this country. So if what women, I'm hearing you say is... But women find a place for trans athletes. That's my point. So women aren't the issue with this. Women already are very happy for trans-identifying females to be in their category. They really have no issue with it. Trans-identifying males somehow don't feel welcome in the men's category. So it's men oh, that need to resolve sucks, this problem, yeah. not women. So, so that's your response to... That's your response to Charlie, and I think... Well, I was just going to say that trans men do compete in male categories. And actually, if you go out there and you look, there's there's quite a few of them. I can mention a few of them. Chris Mosey, a triathlete, first known trans man to represent US in international competition, qualified yeah, for Olympic very, very trials. Few, though, versus the very, 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 very few versus trans identifying males who compete in women's sports. So I could give you about 200 you know, examples okay. in America, cycling alone. Yeah. So 
and that's what really bothers me with all of this all the time it's just women that are supposed to budge over i don't believe the solution is to try to include somebody in a category where it doesn't fit maybe the solution is to try and create extra categories so uh charlie what you're hearing there yeah thanks sharon i'm hearing that you feel that you're under threat and i think that's something that really comes across me well you said that you are being threatened Oh yeah, family. personally, but that's because I speak out. So, so the people I speak out for are the young girls that will lose their opportunities today. I'm hearing Sharon's yeah. ideas around, you know, a solution being an extra category, um, which which is strange because only a couple of days ago on Talk TV she said that that category doesn't work. No, I don't believe it will work. I believe an open category is the answer. But I'm saying it's it's part of a respectful debate. You know, you throw in all sorts of options and you listen yeah. to everything. I think to an extent why she yeah, feels aggrieved and yeah. why she would be able to channel that into something she feels is a positive action to protect women but I can't get over the fact that she doesn't acknowledge trans women as women and trans men as men and that's a fundamental stumbling block that I think we're gonna Karen De Sharon Davies needs therapy. Yep. Sharon Basically, Davies, yeah. Sharon Davies, you're an old crone who's still upset over a race you lost 44 years ago. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. If you have a problem with yeah. East Ger with an East German beating you because they were on dope, Petra Snyder lives in Germany. Go there. You know, and it's, it, 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 well, there, do you want BBC? I love Charlie Martin. Charlie Martin is polite as pie and wonderful and everything that's right and decent. She she's a bit she's a wonderful advocate for trans people in the UK. But the fact of the matter is you put this you put Miss Money Penny against you put Miss Money Penny against Pussy Galore and it wasn't fair. So uh, you know what? BBC Four, let me take on Sharon Davies. The first thing I'll do is sing the East German national anthem to her. Because <laughs> transgender people had absolutely nothing to do with DDR state reach for its plan for 14.25. Right. We had nothing to do with the fact that you weren't fast enough because a doper beat you. You no. have a problem with Petra Schneider, Look. you go to Germany and you deal with it with her. But don't beat up on me and mine, and especially young trans kids in the UK who are already taking a beating every day from yourself and Posey Parker and Pierce Morgan and the Tory guy and the Labour government because they're not much better. That I felt for Charlie. Well, let me let me and let me just was, say. Let me, by the way, the whole just, interview let, I put it in the I put in the notes about twenty eight minutes. I can tell you, I don't know. I felt for Charlie because Charlie's actually trying to have a conversation. Sharon Davies went there to embarrass her. Sharon Davies went there with one purpose and one purpose only. Sharon, I mean, it was it was like um it was like a rowboat going against a German U-boat. That's how bad that was. Well, let that me was, just say that was that, that was let me, let me, a garage action, and that was not right. I'm, let me I'm just like, say that when 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 we're talking about when we're talking about uh, gender affirming hormone therapy, uh, that right. wasn't what Lance. That's uh, that wasn't what got Lance Armstrong thrown out of the out of no. uh, out of cycling. What and it was in fact gender affirming gender affirming hormone therapy. I mean, and he had testicular cancer, and it's like, well, you know. You're gonna lose your. You're gonna lose your, your, your. You know, it's a therapeutic thing. It was a medically necessary thing for this dude. The blood doping, on the other hand, was not. He had a therapeutic use exemption for the for the testosterone. He did. He cheated by by uh, increasing his VO2 levels uh, by by stockpiling his blood so that he would have more oxygen carrying capacity in his bloodstream when he did the Tour de France. Guess what happens mm -hmm. as a result of gender-affirming hormone therapy for transgender women? Rather quickly, in fact. Decreases. Dr. Ben? Yeah. Dr. Decreases ben, those fill us things in. that give you an advantage. Tell, fill us in. 
Yeah. Very, very drastically decreases those things. And very quickly. <laughs> yeah. I mean. That's science. That's medical science. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand. And the, and the other yeah. thing, before, before, I, before yeah. I get off my, before I get off my soapbox, the other thing I have to say is just politically, Martina Navratilova looks rather stupid because there is an interview out there wherein people asked her about Jen, uh, about Renee Richards. Uh, and, and she said that they asked, well, how did you feel about com competing against Renee when they were in the circuit together? It's like, oh, we were fine with it. We would, might not have been quite so fine with it if she was winning matches. And that's, the, um, but that's what it you is. Know, that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, we all, we all know the game. I mean, we, we know what the game is. And for me, listening to that, my whole thing is, though, is that Sharon Davies sounds like went there to went there basically with an axe to grind. And that happens a lot in the media is that, and to be blunt, the, the moderator was trying to keep them on, talk to the issues, don't try and the rules of that show, the way that show works is well, one person asks you a question, the other person responds to that question. And here's Sharon bringing on 50 other things that have nothing to do with what Charlie's talking about. And during the time, so, using that trans identified nonsense, which is really soft ass misgendering. Trans identified and, male. Yes. And to me, that wasn't right. To me, especially, that just wasn't right because here's Charlie Martin. And and if you've ever seen, like, if you've seen Charlie Martin's vi videos on her website, her social media, she's always very upbeat. It's always very upbeat. It's always about, you know, find your mountain, off you go. And she's been through reasons mm -hmm. where she's had no reason to be upbeat. I mean, she's had a lot of racing. She's had a lot of deals in racing fall through because people are not, because people get their own little transphobia going on, but she keeps on keeping on this. I mean, earlier the, early in, in um, July, she got an opportunity to race at uh, June. She, rather, she got an opportunity to race at Le Mans. That was great. I hope that somebody comes up with a seat so she can do the 24 hours next year. I mean, just a note to, to teams out there. If you're looking for a good hot shoe that can, that your sponsors will love, you want Charlie Martin. If I had, if I had a prototype team, I, she'd be the first person I'm calling. But of course, I'm a little bit broke, so I can't have that. But to me, that was just horrible. <laughs> that was a, that. I'm like Ben. You got anything to add to this? Because it's. I mean, well, to me, the yeah. the whole this just transphobes are wow. It's, funny it's wild, and and it's funny because trans men break their narratives so much they just for either forget about us, you know, and intentionally don't mention it because if their categories exist where we are rigidly stuck within our chromosomal categories or our gamete potential categories if you go down those goalpost moving scenarios like <laughs> i for all intents and purposes should stay in a women's division despite the fact that all of their concerns towards but you have hormones that give you an advantage well like i do i intentionally do but why are you more worried about these trans women who are taking a hormone that gives them a disadvantage, yet I'm too weak of a person to go in a men's division with my hormones that will give me an advantage, and I should still belong in the women's division, but I'm not robbing things from women. I'm not, I'm not oh. robbing any of that i'm not in the wrong place and and it's funny because the times where they have gotten on on trans men's cases were primarily in like wrestling where they've been in men's divisions uh you're talking about like for example mac beggs yeah it's and like, like, and like he was he was crushing people in the in the women's division and stuff but like and they're trying to say that he has a trans woman, but well, he's yeah. not. Well, he's a you trans know, man. And then he went on to compete not. in men's divisions. He and went on to compete. Like he compete. He went won. to a boys' tournament. Yeah, he went to a boys' yeah. tournament. In fact, he was at the team. He was at the USA Wrestling Texas tournament, where you can make 
team Texas. And, and like, there is like this big wrestling wrestling tournament of the States where each state brings an all-star team. He made team Texas. He finished third in that tournament against boys. He beat two state champions in his weight class to get to that final. Mind you, he's a, no, I mean, Mac Beggs was no joke. He, all he wanted to do was wrestle as the boy he is. And, but that, and that's all of it. See, I'm of a belief that, that, for example, if Hergie Bakladon, the Philippine boxer who, Philippine boxer who was at the Olympics, I'm convinced if he would have won, people would have lost their mind because he was a man, but who hadn't started in HRT, was still competing in a, in women's competition because he hadn't started a hormone replacing therapy yet. Mm-hmm. And, and said point blank, I have no reason I don't want to, has said openly that he won't pursue those options in the future, which is which he's within his rights to do. Mm-hmm. But I think people, when, when you get some, some young trans boy, and there's plenty of trans boys playing high school sports, one of them ends up being like a Rivals 100 selection that's going to Division One. You know, people going to lose their mind. People got people gonna still lose yeah. their mind about that. I mean, right. eventually it's, it's gonna go. And and as well too, because like of people who because I come from Brazilian jiu-jitsu and like our, our sport culture is very unique in that it's it oftentimes can be more egalitarian than a lot of sports, um, because of what women's jujitsu has done and what they have fought for. Um, but it's really funny because you walk into most gyms and the person who is kind of seen as the mat enforcer, like the one who humbles all the, the new people that come in thinking that they're hot shit is usually a very small cis woman. Like that's the person who's the one you don't, you don't want to take on because she will wreck you and send you home crying. Like, and that's, that's how it goes. And that's, that's consistent <laughs> among most jujitsu like academies is that there is a small cis woman that will wreck your shit. And if you can handle it, you stay and you get better. And if you can't handle it, you leave and you, <laughs> you don't do jujitsu. So it's like the the assumption that like athleticism is masculine and that women aren't contenders just as themselves and don't have biological advantages. Like you're absolutely missing what sport is. And and we've all touched on that. Um and, and in yeah. fact uh, yeah, there's a lot more like in, in a lot of sports, women's sports are more fun to watch because they're a lot more dynamic. Um, they don't have some of those biological advantages to to use as crutches oftentimes like in, in early training. And so you just get some really amazing technique. And that's also what happens with trans women um, who don't have those biological advantages. Again, like as we're seeing in the data, there isn't a biological advantage. To being a trans woman. Well, I, you know, that, 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 oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I gotta get the, I, I gotta get out the elephant in the room. There's the elephant in the room right mm-hmm. there. The, the elephant in the room is is uh, trans misogyny, and it and it hits trans men as much, at least, as it does trans women, because there are these assumptions that we have about what an individual, you know. Sports is about individual excellence, right? Within a certain within a certain d- bunch of criteria, but it's about individual excellence. It's sports are not fair. The first panel that we did, that's the first thing I said. <laughs> it's when somebody asked that question. Sports aren't fair. I mean, it's like they're they they're. It, it it's a weird thing, but there are these cultural assumptions that that keep and 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 it came out with with the with the whole boxing thing that's not feminine she looks like a man Mm -hmm. she's not but you know there's that and and the and the same thing goes where uh there's this there's this assumption that a trans guy is never going to make it you know and and so we're seeing this we're seeing this thing where 
oh, trans women are going to dominate sports, and trans men are just, well, nice try, honey, but you know. Yeah. Well, you know, You're it's just also... just a girl, you know, it's bullshit. Well, and, and another thing is, not only are they saying you're just a girl, they're trying to, everybody is still... It's interesting because now everybody's wondering how do we define woman or girl now? How do we define it? Because in the four, you know how they you know what they do. What is a woman? Well, apparently you just said that a money Khalif, a money Khalif, a cisgender woman's not a woman. So go on. Yeah, because they were saying I mean, it was anatomy, and now they're saying no, uh, it's your chromosomes and not I mean, right. anatomy. I mean, and and, and people, this, okay. is, this is this so is where this not, is where I yeah, so that is not your and hormones is, either. Yeah. If it's just Most, your chromosomes, and this is, then you're saying that the hormones do not matter. The fact is, and this is where I get. Uh, this is where I get. Yeah. This is where this argument. I I butt up against the argument of of people who, who are they don't, but that's allies. The now it's like who will who will say, uh, oh X Y. That means you're disqualified from women's sport, regardless of your of, of your of your phenotype. Regardless of your the, of your hormonal makeup, regardless of the entire cluster of things that contribute to the kind of physicality you can actually display, and so I'm sorry, Mr. Woodford. I'm sorry, Professor Dave. You're wrong. You're wrong there. Well, I can tell you this much. I mean, I'm sorry, even, Pine Creek. It even goes. You know? It even I'm goes sorry. into things. You're but wrong. it even goes into things such as style of play. I've heard this from, I this is not the first time we've heard this about cisgender women. We've heard this all, all through. I mean, a perfect example. Look at the WNBA. People, people, people diss the WNBA because the women are tall, gay, and largely black. Let's just be real about that. Or they're not the right. If you're not a girl, first they say you're not a girl, then they say you're not right kind of girl. Um, I don't like watching Diana Taurasi play. She plays too much like a man. Never mind. She's a great member of mine. Watching her play is like watching symphonies being created. I mean, watch it. I mean, 20 also, oh, she's, she's too old or she's too good or she's too this or, or here's this. She's too pretty or she's too athletic. I mean, come on. Simone Biles is considered Simone Biles has ruined gymnastics. Some people say. Never mind that she's captivated more by people. being excellent, by being good, yeah. <laughs> like, by, right. being, by being by hey, being hey, untouchable. Katie Ledecky has ruined swimming. Like, oh yeah, right. Right. What's, the point, of, great, what's the point of the Olympics? Then? Like, what's the point of these? Yeah. If, if you don't want people to show up with their best, well, my why is, are you people, asking them to compete say, at the best? I want to. I want to be clear. I'm not. I'm not trying to lump. I'm not trying to lump people who are actually allies into the same into the same uh, basket right. as as people who are hostile, literally hostile to us. But you got to ask yourself, why are you drawing the line there? Why? Mm -hmm. But even but while we're not trying, but I also look at allies with some side uh, people who who claim allyship. Who are saying things like, "Well, Amani Khalif wasn't trans. She wasn't trans. She wasn't trans. So it's, it's so wrong that she, that she was being treated this way." But here's a question: Let's say that it wasn't Amani Khalif. Let's say you had a boxer from Canada named Irma Ketterman, who was right. a transgender woman. Who, by the way, transgender women would have been allowed to compete in boxing at this Olympic tournament because the IOC. Through the Paris Boxing Unit ran the Olympic tournament, and the Olympic tournament went by one the rules that the IOC had set in regards to the to the testosterone, serum testosterone standards in 2015. Those rules were in effect. One and number two, the framework on fairness would be in effect for this tournament, i.e., especially principle five, principle six, no presumption of advantage without definitive proof of said advantage that must be shown by scientific, medical, and competitive avenues. Peer-reviewed research. Peer-reviewed research. It it's says, in, says it's that in, in the paper. <laughs> it's in the regs. And by the way, I am going to put those regs in. If you don't know what the regs are, I'm putting them in the chat. If you don't know what they are, because that's one of the things that 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 
transphobes do. And another thing that transphobes do is do a bait and switch. And that takes us to our to our last story for this part of the segment is era is you remember last month we had that great mini documentary the anno- annoying positive the erica smith story erica smith a uh, former student athlete at sweetbriar college Div- ncaa division three school in virginia the first the first out transgender full-time student first student first transgender student athlete in the history of school and she was a touchstone on that campus free kick it well Erica was basically ran out of school mm-hmm. three year, um, a couple of years back because of being trans, because the, the administration basically said enough. But now they went full transphobe here. Last week, the trans briar, the sweet briar administration announced that they would not allow any tra- that their school be restricted to women who were women from birth is the exact words that they use for this. Now, Bree put me back on. Now, Erica is not putting, Erica is not taking this line down. She's not. What Erica has done and a group of alums of the school have done is they've come together and said, we're going to fight this. And Erica took the YouTube a few days ago to talk about why. Bree, roll the clip. Free, kick it. Hey everyone. Here we go. Um, Erica here. It has been a long time. Um and uh time to kind of dust off the channel here and get back to doing what I loved and um kind of spreading the word and advocating again. Um and you know, for those of you that are still here or um, oh, seeing this again, you know, thanks for sticking around and for everybody new. Welcome. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Erica Smith. I am a trans female athlete, um, an advocate, educator, um, uh, college professor. And I was first female, trans female to attend the all women's college, Sweetbriar college. And there was a lot of great there and there was a lot of controversy. And it's been a few years since I've been there, but some things have changed. And I've had a lot of people when I was at the school tell me, come up to me and tell me that my videos on here helped them to decide to come to Sweetbriar because it was so welcoming and sense of community. And unfortunately, I have to sit here and say that I'm being told it's no longer that way. So we're going to re- resurrect this channel as a place to first have a conversation why what's going on there um share some of my experiences both positive and negative um and air out some skeletons in the closet of things that occur at sweetbriar that maybe people should know that a lot of people don't and currently i was informed by a few students that currently go there that are um, on the gender spectrum or non-binary that uh, they have now officially changed their admissions policies to be very exclusive and however it's very vague and I'm interested to look more into it and to investigate and see where um, these came from how they're going to enforce it what they're going to do with it for example on their website it states that Um, you must confirm that you were signed female at birth. I don't know how someone can confirm that. Now, someone may say, Uh well, birth certificate, Erica, (laughs) obviously. My birth certificate says female because I had it changed. And when I was admitted to the school, my birth certificate said female. And they were fine with it until they found out I was trans and tried everything they could to get rid of me. Um, And... But additionally, their new policy on their website, again, states that you they also only want people presenting as female and identify as female and live female full time. And again, I don't understand this metric of how 
where did, where's the cutoff of presenting as female? Are they going to start gatekeeping hair length or um, clothing or style of makeup or um, like again as a as a philosopher and a biologist like you can't even define female very well using genetics and that's a whole other video not getting into it but just stay tuned for the next few days i'm going to be posting stuff and doing a deep dive into this um share this video with people that you may know if you stumbled across here wondering if you might want to go to sweetbriar or you want to keep up with what's happening there or whatever you know leave a comment down below share it um feel free to ask questions and again i'm not discouraging people from attending there my intent is to get to the bottom of what's going on and to help alleviate fears of many students that have reached out to me and to do what we're supposed to do as human beings help each other and support each other sweetbriar felt safe for a very long time for me and the fact that it's not feeling safe anymore for some people that needs to change so welcome back to me i guess and you know if you found that you've outgrown me or whatever cool but if you want to stay and follow more or just curious then keep a lookout for the next few days but i'm going to sign off here and uh i'll keep you updated bye By the way, if you want to, if you want to know more about her, put her put her website. We put her YouTube site on the chat, and if you want to check out annoyingly positive there, the Erica Smith story, that can be that you can find that here at the Transpositions YouTube channel, and you can find it on mine. Um, needless to say, Erica is somebody who I consider a she's a sister to me, and. She's someone I think is special, and I think she'd be an asset on any college campus anywhere for who she is. And I'm, I've am i been kind of on the ups and downs of the roller coaster with her, kind of a, like on the periphery of the events. And I can tell you that um, all I can say is, Sweet Briar, you picked the wrong one. You really did. No, this is not the person you cross on this. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of support on whatever Erica does. And, but this goes back again to the fact is it goes back for me. It goes back to what Skylar Byler always says is that trans people aren't the problem. Transphobia is, and that's what this is. And Stephanie, I know you got more, you got plenty more to say. So I'm going to throw this over to you. And I'll cause be I know you want to talk about what's been happening in the, you want to you want to talk about you said bookends of the week, bookends of this uh, Olympic period that bookends, we had. Well, just for myself. Oh my God, I'm blurry again. Holy smokes, I, I can't be blurry. This is no good. Uh, let's see. I gotta be kill the kill the camera and then turn the camera on. Maybe I won't be blurry. No, I'm still blurry. I think I gotta actually kill the camera. Eh, still blurry. Holy shit. Well, you know, it's just a thing. It's just a thing. I can, uh. There we go. That'll do it. There we go. Shop is attacked, by golly. So here's my week. Um, it's it's kind of an interesting story. Um, to me, anyway, at least meaningful. In that, um, I started a, uh, or was part of, of, of starting a uh, community sailing program in Portland, Maine, that has grown and grown and grown. Gives Kids an opportunity, you know, Maine has 3,800 3, miles of coastline. Why aren't kids getting out on the water, you know, regardless? And so we started a community sailing program, uh, was started out as a, as a, 
uh, the University of Southern Maine's sailing program, and it just sort of grew. As a matter of fact, some of the some of the kids at the time who were in USM's program wound up being executive directors and, and key parts of, of, of the enterprise as we grew from from uh, a small little organization to uh, uh, having five regional sailing teams that compete all over New England as part of uh, the uh, Northeast Scholastic Sailing Association, NASA. Um, and these were kids that didn't go to Tabor Academy and didn't go to Choate and didn't go to all the, these hoity-toity places. They were just kids who wanted to go out and play. Uh, and some of those kids grew up to be my competitors now. Uh, we're, you know, in my, in the J24 racing that I do, uh, we're, we're duking it out with two sail main kids. So we went down, our team went down and, and, uh, and sailed the sail main regatta to raise money for this organization. And, uh, did a good job. We raised about $70,000 for the, for the organization and they need it because it costs money to be able to do these things, to give uh, kids an opportunity to go out and play on the water, mess around in boats. There's some wind in the willows had it. Um, but we, we felt pretty good about ourselves. We, uh, we managed to uh, get around the course four minutes and 35 seconds faster than anybody else. So, yeah. All right, <laughs> good on us. But the most meaningful thing to me was being able to stand up in front of a group of uh, 150 uh, sailors and say, these kids are your future. You should be proud of yourselves that you're coming to an event like this and raising this money. You're having fun, you're having a good time. These kids are your future. One of those kids, when I was at Sail Maine, was a trans kid. And I was there in 2010. And he was a very, very mm, tentative child. And because he was embraced and accepted, he grew up to be a very confident young man with the support of his parents, both of whom happened to be Methodist ministers. And I think it's really kind of important that people realize that Small examples in small places make a big difference in kids' lives. There was a caller on uh, the Transatlantic Call-In Show, and I encourage you to, to uh, listen to that call. It was, I think, the second to last call today. Who was really struggling. I kind of get the I kind of get the feeling that this person may be a, a sophomore or something in college, just trying to reconcile uh, the utter rejection of her family, of who she is. Someone can make a difference in that kid's life, and I hope someone does, and I hope we did over on the line. Um, so anyway, bookend there. Had a successful weekend of, of, uh, of racing. And the cool thing is, in that circle, nobody cares if I'm trans or not. This weekend, I'm racing in a double-handed regatta. Uh, that we've done up here for 
for a while. And uh, my friend Richie de Grand Prix, God rest his soul, uh, sailed with me for ages and ages, pre-transition. He happened to be a Freeport Town Councilor, and he and I butted heads on, on a few issues. He's not exactly the flaming liberal, but we were always friends. But when I came out, when I transitioned, he said, well, you know, Steph, I didn't, wasn't really sure if you were going to be sailing, uh, you know, after all this. So I, 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 told, I told Jeff I'd, I'd sail with him. And that was kind of a, that was kind of a gut punch, but it was like, yeah, okay, Richie, I, I, I get it. I wasn't really sure how much racing I would do anyway. Um, but he was, he, he was a, a fixture in the fleet and all of this stuff. He got used to me. As he got to know his friend as who she was. Uh, this this libertarian conservative dude got to know his friend a little bit better than he'd known her before. And this regatta is the Rich to Grand Prix regatta. And I'm going to go out and sail on Jeff's boat, the guy who Rich abandoned me for years ago because Jeff asked me to do that. Jeff is also a guy who is by nature quite right wing. But he offered me the boat and he offered me uh, the opportunity to go out there because we both loved Richie. And I'm really looking forward to doing something. I might, I, I, you know, I'll, I could be like Stu McNay and go the wrong way and uh, not do real well. But I know I'm going to have a good, good goddamn time with the young woman who sails with Jeff. And I hope I can teach her something, too. So don't give up. You know, don't give up. Don't ever give up. People's hearts do change. It might take a little bit of time, but people's hearts do change. And with that, that's transposition sport. That's transposition sports for Ben Hamilton and Stephanie Hams Helms. I'm Carly Chardonnay Webb. I'll see y'all next week.